Я дуже радий, що тут всі є, і я маю нагоду зараз представити наступного спікера на AI Summer Weekend. І сьогодні ви, напевно, чули про застосування штучного інтелекту в дуже багатьох галузях, які вже є такі, що ми можемо це відчувати і бачити вже прямо зараз і сьогодні. І наступний спікер – це є Орестіс Георгіїв з компанії Ultra Haptics. І вони застосовують штучний інтелект вже в комбінації з новими технологіями. І таким чином ви можете вже зазирнути в майбутнє, от що буде от дуже скоро і чим ми будемо користуватися дуже скоро. Власне, з Орестісом ми познайомились вже років сім тому в інституті Макса Планка в Німеччині. Тоді ми працювали разом, після чого він працював в компанії Toshiba. І від інженера-дослідника до старшого інженера-дослідника. І після чого він перейшов в компанію Ultra Haptics і допомагає цій компанії налагоджити зв'язки і таку мережу співпраці в світі з академічними установами і з різними науковими групами. І це дуже класно, що ми маємо нагоду послухати його в УКУ і, власне, побачити, от що відбувається на от піку такого human-computer interaction. І я дуже... Буду втішений, якщо це надихне студентів УКУ і також людей з меж УКУ долучитися до, цього, до цих досліджень і в академії, в індустрії і навіть як хобі. Тому я дуже радий вітати Орестіса на цій сцені. Хто не дуже буде розуміти англійську, там можна взяти навушники, щоб з перекладом і слухати. І so I will switch to English. So... I really welcome uh, Orestes on the stage, and we are very glad that you are here. And so I really hope your talk will inspire many of these like young minds to join human-computer interaction research and actually apply a lot of what they learned here about artificial intelligence to this field. So please welcome. Um. Thank you, Miguel, for the kind words. Thank you, Alexi, for organizing this and inviting me here. Uh, and really thank you, everyone, for coming here to listen to me on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I'll be um, talking about my employer, Ultra Haptics. Uh, I'll be talking about touching the invisible and the emerging field of media haptics and HCI. HCI is human-computer interaction. Um, do you prefer if I use the microphone? Or shall I? I should use. Okay. Um, so um, I can I can basically tell you a bit about I plan to tell you a bit about the, the company, a bit about the technology and the people behind the technology, and of course um, I'll be keeping it simple, lots of images, videos, um, and trying to give you an intuition of what's behind all of this. So at the end, since this is an I weekend uh, school, I added some slides on machine learning kind of problems and where I see the application of um, machine learning in ultra haptics and what we're doing. Um, by the way, I had a small demo um, 15 min uh, for 15 minutes outside. I hope most of you have tried um, our prototype, which is this type of device. Um, I can set up something after the talk as well. So um, let me start. Let's see if this works. Great. So who is Ultra Haptics? It's a company who is very much invested and interested in the business of touch. So touch is haptics. It's what we feel. Um, and we're interested in the role of touch in user interfaces and user experience. It's, a six, it's currently a $16 billion industry which is expected to triple by 2022, so four years from now. Um, so I will explain details about HCI and haptics a bit more um, uh, later on. Um, but for now, all you need to know is that we're in the business of touch, and we use ultrasound. Ultrasound is just the same as sound, just higher frequencies. So it's beyond our hearing spectrum. It's what bats. Uh, used to communicate, it's what dolphins used to communicate, it's what we use to scan inside uh, our bodies, we have mammograms or um, uh, when we go to see our babies. So um, we have a very different use of this technology, we use ultrasound 
for touch and user interaction. So as a company, we offer technology, solutions, we offer services, and we try to create magical experiences. So a bit about the history of the company. Um, it was it's a spin-off company from the University of Bristol, uh, Bristol in the UK. Um, those are the three founders, Tom, Shri, and Ben. So Tom was doing his PhD, stu uh, PhD studies with Shri, and Ben was a postdoc at the time. Uh, and they spun out this company um, in Bristol. They got some initial, initial funding in 2013. And every year, they've been basically getting more and more investment. Um, and we've been total raised something like uh, 30 million euros, um, 35 million euros over the past uh, four years. So when I joined the company one and a half years ago, we were 50 people. I was employee number 51. And now we have about 93 people um, in Bristol. Um, and we have offices in the UK, in Munich, in Singapore, and in Palo Alto in California. So we've been growing pretty fast. Um, and we've done that mostly by working with uh, big brands, partners that believe in us and help us grow and demonstrate this amazing technology and its full potential. So you'll see lots of big names over there. Um, this picture over here is our first commercial product. So um, it's a gaming machine which offers a 4D experience. It's a three-dimensional screen plus the sense of touch. So whatever you see in the screen, you can reach out and touch it and feel it. Um, these are our some of our investors, the main investors that we have um, who have believed in the team um, and they have enabled us to assemble all these people, 91 people, what do we do? Uh, it's a really an expert, a team of experts basically who have made this possible because as I will show you, uh, there's quite a lot that needs to be done. So uh, this is what uh, we like to think of um, our company, our team. Um, we're a global team of experts and we have teams in Bristol who are doing hardware in electronics, acoustics, so measuring with microphones, software developers, application developers, and advanced research cluster team, which is my team. This is the team that I lead. Um, and essentially, all of this comes down to these three areas. So haptics, human-computer interaction, and ultrasound. So before I tell you more about these three areas, what's, what's interesting is what you be surprised to know is that my background has nothing to do with haptics, HCI, or ultrasound. So I will briefly explain what my background is. And that is, I don't know what uh, Mikola said earlier about me, but <laughs> um, uh, my background is in mathematics. Uh, that's what I did my PhD in, um, dynamical systems. I did a postdoc in Germany in Max Planck in quantum physics. Um, and then after that, I moved to industry and worked for a company called Toshiba, um, which you probably know. It's a Japanese company that deals with electronics. So I worked in their wireless networks department. So Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G networks, um, and Internet of Things infrastructure. So I had this strange trajectory, and how did I end up? in ultra haptics that does HCI haptics and, uh, uh, and ultrasound. Well, I am passionate about research and I'm very passionate about development and I'm very passionate about innovation and impact. So I've always been motivated by, this is my favorite quote by MC Escher. So he who wonders eventually discovers that this is itself a wonder. So. I was wondering, I've always been wondering, how can I have an impact? How can I change the world? And so this got me into this position where I've published a lot of papers, I've published a lot of patents, I've um, presented my science in 19 countries. This is the 19th country that 
I presented my science in. Um, I have raised about 3 million euros from a Horizon project for my company for a project that is starting in October and I'm very excited about. I lead a team of five people uh, within the ARC, within the um, advanced research cluster in my company. I have four PhD students, lots of interns, and I've created a network uh, of 55 partnerships with 55 different universities around the world. So here's a map of them. Um, so we have students and groups, research labs, even schools, high schools, who are spread around the world trying to find applications and come up with cool demos that use a touchless, invisible technology that is what Ultra Haptics is. So the Red Stars is where Bristol is and where Palo Alto is, which are our main two offices. That's where I'm from. I'm from Cyprus, tiny dot on the map. Um, um, so, as I said, it's not just impact and uh, innovation. That's me on a swing in virtual reality. So this is something that will become the norm. Um, you'll, you'll be wearing a headset and swinging on a swing. It's really cool, actually. Uh, before I go there, maybe I can. So I'm also doing a bit of climbing in virtual reality. So these are uh, pretty cool and quite interesting uh, fun examples of what you can do in virtual reality. And it's not just you know waving your hands in, in thin air without touching anything. You can actually touch a real swing or a real climbing wall. This is not real, it's a star trooper. Um, but what we want to do in in ultra haptics is we want to um, recreate the feeling of touch in a digital world. So two fundamental questions. What is HCI and what is haptics? So let's define it. In a very simple terms, it is the use of computers to design new interfaces between humans, the users, us, and computers. And an easy way of thinking about it is the how they are manifested in a input device. So traditionally, this has been a keyboard, a mouse, or a joystick controller. More recently, we have cameras like this one, or a webcam that we can interact with, voice command, K Siri, touch screens that we can touch and interact with on our phones, tablets, everything. So what is the next step? Well, I think it will be embedded sensors and actuators. So these, everything is miniaturized. It becomes more and more invisible. So we won't actually have keyboards in the future. We won't actually have mouse pads. We won't actually have touch screens. I think this is where we're going. So we have to prepare for this future. And something that we lose in this touchless and invisible future um, is the sense of touch. And touch is very important to us. It's the first thing that we learn when we, uh, when we are born. It's a combination of tactile and kinetics. It's something that um, is a um, combination of things like contact, pressure, friction, textures. Whereas kinetics is position, orientation, force. It's something that we have from proprioception of our muscles. So, so what, how do we traditionally understand haptics in technology? Well, classically, it's a controller that vibrates, our phone that, that vibrates. And what this vibration is supposed to inform us about is haptic feedback. So if something has happened, and therefore, you feel that vibration. There's feed forward or feed up, where we can convey information about direction, uh, information about location, information about the function of some widget, an action, or its status. So um, in the next slide, I have a very interesting video about how we see 
these haptics coming together in the not too distant future? It starts with a question. Load women size eight. Followed by an idea on how to make things simpler, better, or more beautiful. Approximate shape from sketches. But it's not just what it looks like. Load cross-terrain sequence. It's how it works. Which means trying. And failing. And trying again. To be a designer means not being bound by the limits of your tools. But instead... Expand box. Being inspired by them. Show me the upper. So that you can focus on what only you can do. Being creative. Being curious. And being critical. Exploring the union between function and form. Until suddenly you know. Optimize cushion pattern for terrain. That's it. And when you're ready to share your work, make sure everyone can see that the world is a little simpler, better, and more beautiful. So in that concept video, there were quite a few technologies that almost already exist and we are quite familiar with in our daily lives. It's just that they all work together in synergy to produce something pretty amazing. And it may well be available to designers, content creators, um, educators, students. I mean, the potential of this is, is huge. So what kind of technologies were shown there? We had touch screens, we had a stylus pen, we had a dial pack, you had an AR headset, voice command, there was embedded intelligence where the the AI could respond to you and understand your, your, your input. Uh, there was network connectivity. There were three people working in different parts of the world interacting with this digital content. Um, there was uh, a live optimization problem being solved on the fly. And right here, there is a hologram and there is ultra haptics. So this is one of our devices which can add the sense of touch to hologram um, objects, which could, for example, could be this shoe. So how does it work? So a lot of you were asking earlier, how does it work? Here's how it works. You have a simplified view of small speakers. These are ultrasonic speakers, just like these ones. And they emit ultrasound waves at different times, with different phases and different amplitudes, and they propagate and they collide at the same time, with the same phase, with maximum amplitude, and through the principle of superposition, they amplify each other to create a high pressure point that you can feel. So not only can you do that um, for a single point, uh, but you can do it for multiple points all over the, all over the hand and you if you do it fast enough you can close the loop and make a system so ultrasound a lot of you were asking earlier is it dangerous and uh, um, how do you use it and this, this ultrasound is used in many many applications uh, we use it, it in fact this is pretty much the same as a parking sensor that you have in your car to detect the distance from uh, uh, when from the wall when you're parking, dolphins use it, bats use it, we use it in medicine. So it's it's pretty much um, everywhere. 
Um, what we do is we, we just take a lot of speakers. So to, in this example, we have 256 of, of these small speakers. So by combining 256 separate waves, these can, we can create these sensations in thin air. So this is our first development kit that we released two and a half, maybe three years ago. This is the next generation, which is just a year ago. It was co-funded by the European Union. It's a bit smaller, but um, does the job equally well. So this is pretty much how it works. Let's try and visualize it. So it's blasting, focusing ultrasound onto the hand, but that's not enough. What you need to do is you also need to blink it on and off at a particular frequency that our senses can feel small vibration, vibrations. So let's have a closer look at it. If you use some um, liquid nitrogen, for example, you can view, you can, you can see the distribution of ultrasound and how it's reflected, let's say. So you can see these fringes. So this is where the waves capture some of those dust particles. What you can also do is, since we're creating disturbances in the air of high and low pressure, we can change the refractive index of the air, which means we can bend light. And if the light is bent, it means that we can, we can see the amplitude of a focus. So what is happening here is, Lots of waves are meeting and colliding in this space. And so that's, that's a maximum focus state. That is, that is what you would feel as a, a concentration of acoustic, area, uh, acoustic energy. There are many different ways of visualizing this. I have two videos here. So here's a state which is moving left and right. This is the center of it. Here is being reflected off a piece of wood. Um, and what I will demonstrate here is that, um, I don't know which hand is that, but there's a hand coming in, there's a hand, and you can kind of see um, how everything is reflected off the hand. So nothing is actually being absorbed into the body. What is actually happening is that you're feeling something that is just reflecting and bouncing off of the skin. Now, as I said, we can create single points, two points, three points, make multiple points and move them around in space. So if we point this device onto a bath of, of water, we can software program it to draw out some shapes. So here are three focus states, which are making shapes, a circle, a square, and a triangle. So these are fundamental graphics objects, which means that we can create graphics onto the skin, changing the size and the combination of these objects. You can reconstruct three-dimensional objects. So for example, if we take a sphere and cut it in two, what do you have? You have a circle. So as we cut through a sphere, we feel a circle. As we cut through a cube, we feel a square. And if we, as we cut through a pyramid, we feel a prism, we feel a triangle. So these are fundamental shapes that we can use to recreate three-dimensional objects. But that's, it's one thing to project onto a oil bath, and it's a different thing to project onto the human skin. So our hands are actually extremely complicated objects. Um, there's a whole science about the skin and fingertips, um, fingerprints, and what is happening on different layers under the skin. So if, we, if you think about it, we have, we have eyes, which are the sensors for visual um, input. We have ears for audio. Um, uh, so we can hear, and we have the skin that we can understand um, 
the physical world around us. So under the skin, there are thousands or even millions of mechanoreceptors, and these are sensors which have different actuation times. They have different, they're located in different places of the skin. They have different temporal behaviors, and they activate through different frequencies. So here's a simplified diagram of these four main types of sensors, which are located in different parts of the skin. And they have um, different densities, different receptions, different actuations. So we need to understand these sensors if we are to understand and project haptics onto the skin. So we have a team that is looking at exactly that and how these mechanoreceptors relate to our interactions with the physical world. So different experiences require different mechanoreceptors. So Merkel sensors are predominantly used when we detect edges, curvature, and textures. Meissner for motion, and they're used to control our grip. Um, Ruffini are really good when the skin is stretched. And finally, the Pacinian is feeling through objects. So we detect um, uh, vibrations which may happen at the object or even at a distance. So um, when we touch an object, a lot of things happen on the skin. And small waves propagate through the skin and distribute it through the whole, the whole hand. So maybe I can do a small experiment with the audience. Um, can you um, touch your ear with this part of your hand so it covers up? And then Can you hear it? So that proves that friction and tapping propagates through the whole hand, distance of 20 centimeters, maybe more. So then when we project a pressure point onto the fingerprint, fingertip, we need to understand what hap what's happening on the whole hand. Not only that, if we want to interact with digital content, we need to understand the whole stack of all the way from the application layer down to the hardware. So this is a um, simplified version of what we do at the company and why we need so many teams of engineers, computer scientists, developers, and acousticians. So someone needs to design the hardware, the electronics, define algorithms that work with this hardware and can instruct the hardware. We need to understand what is happening in this space, which is sound and propagation of, of ultrasound in, in space. We need a software development kit so that we can give instructions to the hardware. We need an API, which is an easy intro, intro into this SDK. And then we create virtual objects like Circles, spheres, cubes, triangles, in air, somewhere over here. Possibly a button, for example, a virtual button. But then actually we need to understand what is happening on the skin, because the skin needs to detect that virtual object and infer that, yes, that is a circle, or that is a square, or that is a button. And then we need to build an application, an interface an app that will control all of this, recreate this virtual button, and then we need to think about the user experience because if, it, if the user doesn't like it, we failed. The good news is that if you do it right, 
the results are amazing. It's quite a magical experience. So if all those layers come together and work, in synergy, in equilibrium, then what you get is super exciting. So you can see how, um, coupled with audiovisual feedback, you can create super exciting, interesting technology. So um, something really important that is drives everything that we do is the, the principles by which we design these experiences, these magical experiences. So we've come up with, there's many principles for these design, um, um, design laws and I am only gonna present, try to summarize them in these five. Oh, I didn't see that, sorry. So, um, um, so Star Wars is owned by Disney. So we were invited at a, um, uh, a big event called the Royal Academy of Engineering in London. And we were going to present um, this interactive poster, which I will talk about later on as well. Um, and we needed some content for it. So we contacted Disney. And amazingly, surprisingly, they said, yeah, go ahead, use our content for your interactive poster. And it was just before um, the latest episode was released. Um, and what is being experienced here is, you can imagine, um, the force. <laughs> so from a design perspective, the user experience had to take a metaphor which relates to the content and translate that in a meaningful way for the user experience to, uh, to work. Um, so we, we didn't do a, a pyramid or a triangle because it, it, it's not relevant to this particular case. Does that answer your question? Okay, so, um, so we have these design principles. So uh, our number one principle when, when designing experiences is that the subjective perception of the user is the primary objective function. That's what we're always trying to, to maximize. So we don't use buzzing sensations unless it's a simple interaction. And we always try to minimize any audible noise, which is an artifact of focused ultrasound. Haptics, so the sense of touch that we create, is always complemented by audiovisual feedback. So it's, it's not just a standalone um, sensation. So by using audio and high quality visuals, we can deliver pleasant, insightful, and sometimes even magical experiences. So it's very important in this case to think about how we synthesize these modalities, um, how we coordinate them, and they must be in some synchrony, so we can't have them lagging at different times. Um, another thing is that the feedback, so the effect that you feel through haptics needs to be proportional to the input effort. So this is something that we borrowed from um, the vibrations and haptics found in, in phones. Um, you will notice that depending on how important the action is, that's how stronger the, the vibration effect is. If it's uh, text message, it will just vibrate a couple of times. If it's a telephone call, it will vibrate until you answer the phone. So um, the feedback needs to be proportional to, to the input. When you type a small, sometimes when you type on a keyboard on a touch screen, you have small haptic feedback there as well. So that's also proportional to, to the input. Um, different sensations need to be differentiable, so we need to understand, be able to discriminate between different levels. If it's strong sensation or a soft sensation, fast one, a slow one, so they need to be differentiable. So we have a whole vocabulary of ways of describing haptic sensations. And finally, if we are interacting through gestures, gesture recognition, where you, for example, swipe, swipe left, swipe right, tap, 
or do some symbol to a uh, camera, then if we are to haptify this, this, uh, this gesture, we need to maximize the user experience and improve the performance of it. So what I mean by that is um, you can measure the um, um, quality of a gesture in the sense of task, task time, time to perform, um, or you have some KPIs that I will talk about as well. Um, and haptics can improve that. So we've, this is our, um, where we want to be, and hopefully we will be uh, in the near future. And we want to be in cars. So everyone has cars, and we want to interact with a car um, through gestures and through haptics. And there's a good reason for that. So what you saw there is a study that we're running with the University of Nottingham. It's just completed, actually. Um, and there's a, this is Craig, one of our developers. It's the first time that he's driving in his life. Um, and, uh, he, but he programmed the interaction where you can select track number one, for instance, um, using a gesture, top-down gesture. I'll replay it. Receive tactile feedback so that you know that the action was taken and confirmed. So what's important there is that he completed the task, but really what's really important is what he didn't do. And that is he didn't look at the screen. He kept his eyes on the road. On this three-item menu, press three. On this four-item menu, press two. So again, what this lady managed to do there is interact with a fairly simple, well, average, complicated menu user interface through the sense of touch alone without taking your eyes off the road. And this is really important um, because within the automotive industry, even though we have all this technology, all these cruise control, all these sensors, the number of deaths on the, on the road has actually started to go up. For the past three years, whilst if you look at the plot of how accidents and deaths on roads has been going down for the past three to five years, it's been going up. And the whole automotive industry is scratching their heads and they're wondering, why is that? Could it be that we have too many touch screens in a car, too many, interact uh, too many phones and gadgets which are um, drawing our attention, they demand our visual attention? So what we're trying to do here is take away some of that, release some of that visual attention, and instead substitute it with um, a virtual button that you can touch and interact with whilst driving without taking your eyes off the road. So this is a study that we have run. It's a very simple study, and we've measured, compared with um, a simple touchscreen interaction, um, things like the task completion time, the overshoots, the glances per task, so if you glance off the road, so we used eye tracking technology, we used uh, the number of glances over two seconds, the perce uh, percentage of, of instances where the user could perform the task without even looking at the device, and also the preference. So we have a questionnaire at the end of, uh, I think we set, tested 58 participants, um, what do they prefer? So here are some, some results. These are always above 10%, so 10%, 25%, 13 times more um, people completed a task without looking at the device and just looking at the road. So these statistics over here are, are game-changing and potentially life-saving. So, um, so we are trying to apply this technology in cases that matter. 
Um, so this is more details about further studies needed and um, how we aim to improve this technology further. Another key aspect of, um, of applications of, of media haptics is that of clean interfaces. So if you're touching air, then you're not really transmitting any germs or any bacteria. It's totally clean, so it's hygienic. So it's very interesting applications in medical, uh, for example, operating theaters, but also things like elevator buttons, no one cleans them, um, taps in bathrooms, ATM machines. It's a virtual keypad. And of course, virtual money. <laughs> but the interaction was completely touchless. This is a gaming um, application. It's a VR game that we uh, did last year. It's a bit like Guitar Hero, but Bongo Hero. So you're tapping the bongos, you learn to play the drums, and you can swipe left and right to, to turn. It was developed by four interns over the period of two and a half months last summer. And now coming back to interactive posters that you were talking to me about, um, asking about. So digital brands are trying to engage with us consumers all the time. They have posters, they have ads on Facebook, they're trying to grasp your attention and really sell you the idea of this is my brand. So they do that usually through visual inputs and also sometimes through audio inputs. So there are some sounds which we associate with adverts that we see on TV, for example. Um, more recently, brands, big names, they want to engage with us in a different way. And that is through the sense of touch. So we can imagine interactive posters that you go to the cinema, let's say, to see your favorite, favorite movie, you buy your popcorn, and as you're waiting in the queue to enter the, the movie, you can interact with a piece of content such as the one we had earlier, you can gamify that experience, and not only can you interact with it, but you can have a connection with, this, with, with that brand, with that content that you can feel. It doesn't have to be, um, again, it doesn't have to be something super complicated, it's just the user experience and the content and the metaphor that you are using. But within our company, we also like to be a bit crazy and think about further in the future where we may not, well, we already don't have wires, we're quite wireless, we live in a wireless age. Uh, in the future, we might be uh, screenless, so we might get rid of all the screens, why not? We can do that already with augmented reality headsets. Things like Google Glass, Meta, HoloLens, and a large number of other players entering the, the space where we can have digital content on glasses. So we overlay content that we see onto the real world. So this is the space of augmented reality. And so not only can we see that content, but we can interact with it as well. So this might have applications in simulating digital objects. Before you 3D print them, you can actually ultrasound, ultra haptify them. Um, but going beyond the concept of integrating this technology with existing technology um, or new technology, we have to think about, um, again, new experiences. How can we augment the world around us. So we can, for example, think about um, a traditional interface like these three buttons, but then we can 
augment the space above them. So this is work by the University of Colorado Boulder, um, where they can indicate to a user the location of these buttons before they're actually touched. So you can put your hand out and you can feel where these three buttons are before you actually touch the button. You can then embed some sort of functionality. So this button is a dial that rotates. This button is something that, I don't know, comes up and down. Um, and this does something else. And you can also instill the, the state of that button. So you could instill, say, a volume or um, all sorts of information that you can put into this into this physical world. So you're augmenting the physical world. So this is an investigation which is ongoing. This is another investigation which is ongoing uh, in Krakow University, um, University of Science and Technology in Krakow, uh, where you have a map of, um, of campus, of the university campus. It's an MSc project actually. And Joanna over here has developed a demo where um, blind people or, or visually impaired people can um, interact with this map, navigate the map, feel where the um, points of interest are within, within, within the campus. Again, work in progress. Um, we can do also some other things, which is a bit more um, magical and and maybe science fiction, we can, since we're changing the pressure of air, we can create traps in the air and make things fly. So this is some polystyrene bead, which is being levitated and moved around. It's actually flying and you can touch it. So it's a tangible interface. And you can also, it can be a reactive interface. So this is the same tracking technology that we use in all other demos. Um, the user tells it to do something. And if you notice here, this bead, we just replay the command. So these are different interfaces that we're thinking about um, beyond haptics. What can we do with ultrasound? This is even more crazy. So since we can levitate objects, we can levitate coffee. Coffee is misspelled here. We can add some hot water. Uh, we can, uh, well, we have, if we have hot coffee, we can add some milk as well. Um, this is levitating, by the way, so it's flying. Uh, or we can take a small piece of meat, some lettuce, and two pieces of bread. So we have a sandwich. Or a, bird, or, or a burger. <laughs> so this attracted a lot of attention, actually, um, in different magazines and journals in the UK. Um, uh, we called it Levitating Food. Um, it was featured on Good Morning Britain. Um, you might recognize some familiar faces here. And this is all under a EU-funded project called Levitate. So in summary, um, I've briefly discussed ultra-haptics vision for the future of human-computer interaction. Um, the different parts that we are studying, including skin mechanics, various applications and demos that we have developed, uh, and we see um, we hope that the future can move towards um, these because we see real benefits in them. Um, I've shown you some research projects that students are working on. And I promised some machine learning examples as well to Nicola because this is the uh, uh, also part of this um, machine learning uh, weekend. So, um, so here's my first, um, first open opportunity, which I've um, which which I which I, I number here. 
So this is what the tracking device, an example tracking device like this one at the top, this one over here, sees. It's got two cameras, it's a depth camera. So it's got two cameras like we have two eyes. Um, so it sees my hand and it can understand that that is a hand that has five fingers and it's located here. That's why when a few of you did this tweet or did like this tweet or this tweet, it didn't see five fingers, so it didn't really work. Um, so can we detect gestures using without using a, a depth camera? Can we use something cheaper like a webcam? So that's a classification problem. Am I swiping left, right? Am I tapping? And what's the accuracy of that? Can I denoise the data? make it more smooth, remove any outliers. So just before, um, in the example, uh, in the demo outside, you notice that sometimes you would put your left hand, but it would think it's your right hand, or it might think that your hand is like this instead of like this. So these are outliers that it quickly fixes, but it makes the whole experience a lot more unstable. So we want to have it stable. So this is anomaly detection, classic machine learning problem. Location prediction, so um, if in order for this to run on the fly, it needs to do all the, all the above, including tracking, in real time, very fast. Now if you have an application that inv involves, <laughs> involves fast motion, say you're playing ping pong or something like this, then you need something that can handle this kind of um, uh, speeds. So leap motion has a lag time of about 10 milliseconds um, for tracking. So maybe you can run it on a faster machine, I don't know. But for, for haptics, um, it's really, you don't really need to have a faster tracking. Instead, what you could do is you could predict where the hand is going. So you can predict that it's, it's going to be there because it's predictable. Uh, and you have the data already, so because you know where it's going to be one 10 milliseconds later, so you can use that data in a reinforcement type of learning to, um, um, to just detect where the hand will be in the future. And so if you factor in the 10 milliseconds lag time of the leap motion, and also the lag time of sound propagation, because we know that sound propagates quite fast, but not super fast. If you think about lightning, we see lightning and then we hear it. So there is, it's propagating at not that fast speed, at the scales of milliseconds. There was a question? Thank you. Um, there are many algorithms to, 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 improve, to improve this, so we're always interested in, it's not our core business, but we rely on, on hand tracking, obviously, and we rely on particular aspects of hand tracking, namely accuracy, speed, and cost. Um, is, if this is ever to be deployed in a commercial product, it has to be cheap. Um, so hidden states is, when you try to predict the state of a finger that is not visible. So, you know, what, what is this finger doing? Where is it exactly? Where is my thumb? It's hidden, you can't see it. But a machine that can analyze the whole hand perhaps can predict where that hidden finger is approximately. And that is important if we want to then haptify it. Okay, this is a bit more abstract, so, um, I only put that together uh, an hour ago, so a couple of hours ago. So we have this stack of applications, the whole, everything that needs to work. Um, and a lot of this is computer generated, so it's, it runs on a, on a processor. So can we abstract these models? Instead of knowing exactly what is happening on the skin, which is a very complex system, can we make it a black box 
learn its properties and just treat it like that. Can we do the same for um, the acoustics and the algorithms, which are closer to the metal, and treat that as a black box? Can we combine this into super black box that we then correlate all the way from the user experience to the hardware so that it's completely agnostic? So if I just say I want to have an experience of a button click and the hardware does it. So uh, just to finish this presentation off, I hope I'm on time. Uh, this is our latest development kit, which is available. Uh, it's faster, it's scalable, it's compatible with ARM chips, Arduinos, everything, Linux. It's embedded, so everything is happening on an FPGA, which is embedded behind this uh, device, so no processing required. And we have it tailored to particular applications. And it's out last month and available. It's called Stratos. I need to thank my team, my interns, who sometimes are tasked with making food and barbecue and sometimes going to, uh, to conferences with me. We have a big team of students who participated in Eurohaptic Student Challenge, and they made some interesting demos. Um, and uh, by the way, we are hiring. So we are based in Bristol, and we were voted uh, best place to work in the southwest of the UK. So uh, if you know anyone who's interested in what we do, um, then they can send us, they can contact us uh, and send us CVs, resumes that we store and assess every time we, we want to grow. <coughs> and please keep wondering. Thank you. We'll start some uh, question answering session, right? But uh, our translator will go, so uh, guys, we will talk only English for, from this moment. So, questions? I will bring you mic, okay? Please. Uh. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, how far is this uh, technology from the feeling of uh, a solid uh, touch from the user experience? Thank you for the question. Um, it's not close to the sense of force feedback. So um, this technology is mostly focusing on vibrotactile haptic feedback, which are things that happen on the skin level. So I had a slide where it broke haptics into two, tactile and kinesthetics. Kinesthetics was larger objects, muscle objects, so force feedback is something that you always feel on the level of muscles. Uh, so at your elbow or up in the shoulder. So this technology does not create forces big enough that would push the hand back. Um, that would be very energy inefficient because at the end, we're just using sound. Um, instead, it's subtle haptics, subtle sensations, which are enough um, for us to detect, perceive, and also understand various functions of it. And that's where we are. OK, and uh, one more question. Uh, is it possible now to have the, the pressure in some uh, particular point. So for example, you can feel it like uh, from above and from um, like b below. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, I guess the question is um, when you have a panel like this one, um, you won't be able to feel anything on the back, right? So it's directional. So just like um, you have a spotlight, spotlight only shines light in one direction, similarly with this one. So if you want to have a more three-dimensional experience where you feel something from above and from below, um, what you can do is you can use two of these, one below and one above, and synchronize them, network them together so that they can create a full three-dimensional object. And you don't need too much, just one above and below. This is, in fact, what we have in our
product with uh, IGT, this casino machine, gaming machine, uses two panels, one above and one below. Um, okay, maybe it's easier. Or no, we, no we, we have uh, broadcasting, we need. Uh, in the cases with the cars, isn't it possible if the driver in some dif difficult situation will panic, make some random moves and make some damage with it? Well, uh, it's possible always for that to happen. So. But mechanic, it's uh, easier to control than just an air. So, I mean, that's a very good question. So that is... Um, a design aspect, I think. That's a user interface um, issue that can be addressed. So, um, okay, think of it like this. Um, you can, whilst you're driving, you're in general not supposed to be interacting with a, sec with a secondary task. But if there is a secondary task, you wanna make it simple, and you want to make it um, as visually demanding well, as, as little as possible visually demanding. So this is the current solution at the moment, but you can instill into this solution, you can implement into this solution, all sorts of uh, fail-safe mechanisms um, that can avoid situations like the one that you described to happen. Of course, every time we develop something new, which is unknown, we test it. So we test it in simulators like you've seen, and we test it also out in the wild, in the road. There are regulations for these things. So that you make sure that it's 100% reliable, safe, and user-friendly. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> Up next. Um. Thank you for the presentation. And um, my question is the following. Uh, is that system accurate enough to, uh, for example, uh, for the blind and uh, deaf person to feel the text they can read? So for example, we can like generate uh, some speech to text and they could like read it on the spot. So is it? Uh, accurate enough. So, um, thank you for the question. So, um, being able to communicate with the blind and visually impaired is um, a very interesting research area. So, one of my PhD students is blind, and he's studying something related to this. Um, not exactly translating Braille into thin air, because that's that's is not there yet. That's not the Near, near near future applications. So Braille is is very well established. It's um, something that happens on the fingertip level. It's a micro level, uh, millimeter type of um, resolution. So we don't have millimeter resolution in this example, but instead you can supplement all sorts of audio information with tactile sense of touch, especially for visualizing. So. When I say visualizing, you think of some uh, 3D rendering of that you've seen on a screen or maybe on, 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 a, on a magazine. So virtual graphics, 3D graphics are stuff that we see and we can visualize very easily. For a blind person, they don't have that capability, so they cannot visualize um, three-dimensional objects as easily as we do because they have nothing to base that on. So at school, we learn about things like physics, um, the structure of the atom, for example, or the solar system, and we can visualize it because we've seen it on TV, we've seen it on, on diagrams. Braille cannot deliver that type of dynamic, rich, abstract content. Here you can. So you can feel this, you can interact with it, you can feel an object which might be a planet or the motion of planets, um, so you can help visualize these objects through the sense of touch without the visual component. There is, but Morse is not 
used so much in, in the blind community, as far as I understand. So, but yeah. Uh, so your platform uh, consists of um, ultrasonics, yes. Uh, and how do you know uh, which one to uh, focus and how? How to focus them uh, to make a uh, real uh, tactile uh, feeling and yeah, to give a feedback to uh, move of our hand? So uh, you're asking me how how can we interact with the with the device to to define um, um, tactile feedback? Mm, I mean, have um, in your uh, platform, how does it know uh, which uh, sonics uh, it uh, turns on and in which direction? Okay. Um, so the algorithm that is used to um, invert the problem. So we tell it, okay, here is a hand, here is a fingertip. Which of these sensors need, need to activate in order for haptics to be felt on the fingertip? That's a linear problem that you use linear algebra, you invert the matrix, you solve this, the solution of this, which is essentially the time of flight of these spherical waves needed for them to collide onto that single point. Uh, also talked about uh, some internships and uh, I have a question uh, first uh, how to uh, begin from from which point should I begin study this uh, technology uh, to um, make some uh, research so uh, I think the it's, it's a it's a really good question so how do you start working with ultra haptics and um, how can you um, join our inter in internship programs? So um, a good way to start is there's a lot of literature online that you can read and understand the fundamentals of design, programming, so for interfacing with, with this device, user experience, HCI as well. There are a lot, a lot of literature that you can educate yourself about. And it's very fascinating. Um, and then, if you're passionate about this, um, and um, you want to um, move into the field of user interfaces, then we have an internship program where you can, again, send uh, contact details to um, jobs at ultrahaptics.com. Um, and specifically say, I'm interested in internships. Usually they are summer internships. Um, and um, I guess we have about five positions every year, something like that, three, or three, three four or five positions every year, every summer. So for next summer, um, I guess we'll be looking at applications sometime in, during Christmas or around, around then. So the literature is on the website ultrahaptics.com? There is literature on the website. There is a website about um, our academic program where um, we have small blogs which are kind of bite-sized information about what was the problem, how we solved it, and then we link to the full 10-page or so on academic paper that has all the details. Thank you very much. We have questions here, sorry guys. Okay, sorry. So uh, I want to ask if you were doing any experiment uh, where we were trying to generate sense of different textures, for example, textures of wood and steel, for example. So that's an excellent question. So um, the answer is yes. We we are trying to generate textures and discriminate between textures. We recognize that that is not an easy thing to do using sound. Um, so texture is something um, very difficult to instill into to replicate and emulate using sound. But there are techniques that you can use to make things feel softer, smoother, rougher, slippery, uh, and so on through ultrasound. Couple that with audio and visual feedback. So something that looks like silk and sounds like silk and feels smooth is probably silk. So you will be able to discriminate between these 
silk and maybe uh, denim or like jeans. Um, so this is an investigation that is currently happening. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, actually, uh, as I understood, you are using uh, some ultra sound waves for generating a haptical um, senses. So basically, how does the animal react to these uh, sound waves? Because as I understood, some dogs and cats uh, hear it. And for example, if you uh, cooperate with cinemas or like other places, and um, animals will hear it, and how does they react? It's a very good question. So, um, we ha there, is a, um, there is a diagram that shows the frequency ranges of different animals. This has been studied for a long time. Um, and some animals, like bats, dolphins, dogs, a lot of them, they extend way above our hearing range into the ultrasound. So there are two ways that we can tackle this. First way is that we can go in higher frequencies. And the second one, so that it's no longer audible to any of these pets. And the second one is to actually test and see whether there is this effect. And we have tested. So we have a project uh, internally where we test with, um, uh, we've tried out, we have dogs and pets that come into the office as well. So um, there has been no, um, no, uh, no, nothing funny uh, reaction there. So I think um, the scientific description is that while dogs um, can hear in the 40 kilohertz range, they need extremely loud sounds in 40 kilohertz, way above what we are producing. So even if they could, it's extremely silent for them. Okay, thanks. Other questions from audience? Uh, could your device uh, recognize how many fingers are bended on the hand? If not, uh, do you know how to lean uh, it to recognize the number of fingers? Um, thank you for the question. So um, we rely a lot on third-party tracking devices like the Leap Motion or other cameras that have Kinect uh, or um, um, a real sense from Intel. Uh, that are doing most of the tracking for us. So uh, we rely on those algorithms for uh, detecting finger positions and dynamics. So um, if it doesn't detect a hand, currently we have a fail-safe mechanism that says if it's not a hand, if you don't know what it is, if it's not a five-finger hand, don't output anything. Um, of course, we can change that, but that, that's how we deal with this uh, situation. So if I put my foot on it, for example, it will not recognize a hand and it will, <laughs> uh, it will not operate. Yes? As you know, the speed of sound depends on temperature and humidity. How do you corrugate it? Excellent question. We don't. Uh, <laughs> um, but we could, if we reach that level of, if we wanted to have such an accurate, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, control over the acoustic field, we would have to take that into consideration and add a barometer and a temperature gaze onto the device, but we currently don't. Open problem. they're more expensive. <laughs> uh, but actually, the, um, unless you have significant changes in pressure and uh, 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 humidity and temperature, only then can you really detect uh, a change in uh, the speed of sound. So um, we're talking less than 1% effect in the speed. Yes. Yes, the, the same. Um, don't you <coughs> sorry. There might be some maybe solutions, other solutions. I mean, for example, for cars, you said uh, could we use I don't, know, I don't know speech recognition or something, so we don't do not really you know change our interaction. Or you said a lot about uh, VR. 
So let's, for example, say about gaming. And have you seen Ready Player One? So I mean, they had some kind of outfits. I don't know. Is there might be a, you know a case? Can it be a case? Or? So thank you for the question. Uh, there is, there are many technologies at the moment, which is very exciting actually. The fact that we have so many different ways of actuating haptics, visuals, audio, is not just a screen and a, a keyboard anymore. There are so many, there's a, a whole zoo of devices and objects that can, um, can be used as an input device. Um, and I don't think that there will be one particular one that will dominate them all. Um, different applications, different user tastes and preferences, um, different costs will define what devices and what hardware and what software of embedded actuators and sensors will be found in different applications. So um, in Ready Player One, they're wearing some sort of haptic gloves, yeah, some kind of which gloves are being costume. tracked, the suit, the whole armor suit. So this is more and more hardware equipment that you need to wear, have a small, medium, large, extra large size, different dimensions. Um, you need to wash it, you need to clean it. If it breaks, you need to get a new one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is one device, and you can program, upgrade, update. It's software, and it's a 3D haptic device. But it doesn't give you force feedback, as I explained earlier. Um, in, in vehicles, we have voice control, open the window, and voice control goes out the window because you have wind and you know if you have in a open top cabrio car try try talking to your to your audio system then okay so uh, okay a question so will you develop and your team develop commercial platform uh, do you know uh, any uh, resources with open source platform in this area Excellent question. So at the moment, the, um, our company is quite young. It's three, four, four years old. So everything that we have developed internally, we've sought to protect, um, protect our IP and protect the designs of the electronics and so on so that we can grow fast and attract investment. And that's what we've done. We're now reaching a stage where we want more and more developers to get involved and use this device and, and interact with it, come up with their own um, imaginative, ima uh, creative uh, uh, solutions. And so um, open source solutions are a consideration. Uh, at the moment, I'm not aware of anything which you can found, find on, on GitHub or something like this. Um, and even if there are some attempts, so you could try to put something together from scratch DIY kind of um, media haptics. There's just so much that optimization that we've gone through and iteration here that um, um, it's, yeah, it, 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 it will be very suboptimal, let's say. Um, but um, there, 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 is, there are ideas of, of opening parts of the software so that we can attract um, the developer community. So um, we work with a lot of universities and, and um, 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 what we do is um, we build relationships with these departments, usually through um, permanent staff, professors and uh, lecturers who are responsible for the hardware and the software and they make this available in an open kind of manner for research purposes under special licenses for them to research and teach um, uh, haptics and HCI using ultrasound. Two more questions and uh, we end. Uh, okay, uh, I think that if you want to implement uh, your technology in uh, cars, uh, you must uh, do this very quickly because we know that cars became self-driving. Uh, but my um, my question is uh, about: Is it possible that your device helped not only for the blind people, 
but for people who has insult in uh, mind. Uh, um, if because uh, the physical rehabilitation of uh, for, uh, of uh, insulted people is uh, uh, the rehabilitation um, connection our uh, mind with sensors uh, and um, this uh, help us uh, to to have sense um, by, uh, with your device. Excellent, qu excellent comment and questions. So. Uh, automotive vehicles is the future. It's happening sooner than, than we think it is. Uh, so self-driving cars is a very big topic of, of research. Um, but no one can predict that. What I, so I can't predict exactly how autonomous, how self-driving uh, cars will be. Um, what we are sure about as a company is that um, there will always be an interface, there will be a need for users to interface with the car. It's not like you will enter the car and the car will start driving. You have to interact with it somehow. So that interface, whatever it is, could be embedded, most likely will be embedded, and therefore fairly invisible that you can interact with it through a natural gesture um, scenario. So this is what we are envisioning. So that's where we see us ourselves fitting haptics there. Regarding your question, um, that's an excellent question. So rehabilitation, medical rehabilitation is um, a very challenging field. It's not something that we have expertise in uh, directly, but it's something that we've identified as an area where if someone loses dexterity or motion in their hands for some reason, it could be stroke, for example, so um, or it could be some um, degenerate uh, pathological or some, some other disease. Um, regaining uh, through uh, physical exercise um, and physiotherapy, the sense of dexterity motion um, can be amplified, I think, uh, or sped up, make, make the recovery faster by having feedback and gamifying the experience of, of touching objects like this. So the example we had with this bongo hero, for example, um, some students a couple of months ago developed a guitar hero example where uh, you would have your hand like this, rested on some pedestal, and you would see kind of notes come in on a note highway, and you would touch them as if you're playing the piano, let's say. Um, and you would get a score at the end every time you do it correctly. Um, so. In this example, everything was calibrated such that people who have reduced motion, so they can't completely close, close their fingers, so perhaps they can only go this far. It was first calibrated such that uh, that was the maximum bending that they could afford or achieve. And then through the game, every time they completed a full motion, they would get a score point system. So in this kind of game environment, it was applied to um, a gesture, rehabilitation, um, uh, physiotherapy uh, example with um, uh, so so this was what it was developed and it's it's a demo um, nothing that went into production it's not uh, solution by all means. It needs years and years of testing and, and research, but there is potential there. And it's another very good example of how this technology can change the world for the better. Okay, last question from audience. Is any? Uh, I have one last question. How much does it cost? <laughs> so uh, um, that's an excellent question. So um, there are different types of products and devices that we have at the moment on the market. So we have at least three different generations of, of this device. And they start at um, 2,000 US dollars at the moment. And you can, there are, these are, there are, we work with distributors where you can go online, 
put your credit card in, and it's delivered um, the next day or two or three days after. So availability is out there, and we see them as a one-size general purpose development kit. So if you are thinking of a particular application, um, the spec of this device can, of course, be reduced or increased depending on the application that you want. So for example, this device has a range of about 70 centimeters, so you can interact with it from a distance of this height. In a car, you probably don't need that much distance. But for a VR game set, maybe you need more distance. So this is a generic, generic device. Thank you, uh, Reses. So uh, will we have time to like make another demo? Yeah, or okay. do you want me outside? Yeah, we can here? make it here, right? So, давайте ще раз поаплодуем Орестису. Thank you so much. You find time coming to Lviv. And uh, uh, дякую. Отже, uh, ми чекаємо вас завтра.